Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm from the uh, Faculty of Veterinary Sciences at the university, and also virologist at the Wyoming State Veterinary Lab, and that means I study viruses. And my favorite viruses are viruses which are transmitted between animals, and sometimes animals and people, by uh, blood-feeding insects. What I'm going to share today about is, uh, is a project that we started about three months ago, uh, and it's looking at blue tongue virus transmission. But before I can really tell you about the study, I need to introduce the virus, uh, the animals that it infects, and some of, the, uh, some of the problems. So in Wyoming, we love our wildlife. We love our uh, pronghorn, our whitetail and mule deer, and of course livestock is a very important part of the, uh, of the Wyoming uh, lifestyle as well. So uh, blue tongue disease is a hemorrhagic disease of wildlife. So white-tailed deer exquisitely sensitive to blue tongue infection, uh, but also pronghorn and mule deer. Uh, elk can also be infected. Uh, sheep and cattle can also, um, um, can also get the virus, although, um, although becoming sick to a lesser or more extent. Okay, so as I mentioned, blue tongue is, um, is transmitted by a biting insect, but not like West Nile virus. It is not mosquito transmitted. It's transmitted by a tiny insect that's called culicoides, but you might know it as a biting midge, or sometimes called a, um, a noceum. So this is kind of a comparison here uh, of the size of a culicoides midge as compared to a housefly and a mosquito. And this is the back of somebody's hands, and he's getting these nasty stinging bites from these tiny insects that he can, uh, that he can hardly see. Hence the name noceum. Okay. Um, outbreaks of disease are recognized in the late summer or fall. Now that's when you find the animal sick. What we don't know, and what my study, uh, one of the questions that my study hopes to answer is, is the virus being transmitted at a lower level before you see these big outbreaks in white-tailed deer and possibly in sheep? Okay, so again, this is not something that's going to be transmitted between the animals. Uh, a sick sheep is not going to make the deer sick. Uh, and it's not going to uh, transmit it to cattle. It's only transmitted by this biting vector right here. Okay? So diseases. In white-tailed deer, very high mortality. In some cases, over 90%. Entire, uh, entire herd units can be, can be wiped out. Any of you farmer or ranchers who have pulled dead deer out of a creek or out of a pond, it was likely either blue tongue or its cousin, epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus, closely related. Today I'm just talking about blue tongue, but both of these viruses closely related, they cause identical disease in wildlife. So white-tailed deer, 90% mortality. Uh, mule deer, black-tailed deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and pronghorn, pronghorn antelope can also get a hemorrhagic disease uh, and um, Lots of, uh, lots of death loss. Cattle, usually you don't recognize illness, although they can become infected, and they do ser uh, seroconvert and become antibody positive. Rarely do you notice that they've been infected. Sheep, sheep can get very sick. Um, it depends on the population and the population immunity. So this is kind of what we see again with the white-tailed deer. These animals are feverish, they're seeking out water, and they die acutely. In good flesh, they're just dead in the water. And then if you open these up in a necropsy, you can often see that the lungs are full of fluid, and there's these hemorrhages in the muscles in the, around the heart and under the skin. So this is a pronghorn with those hemorrhages. In sheep, in sheep the disease is sometimes called sore muzzle, Pseudo foot and mouth disease because of the ulceration and the swelling uh, of the mouth, uh, and sometimes muzzle disease. This, uh, this block of uh, registered Rambouillet sheep 
had over 15% mortality. 30% of the, of the flock became sick. The owner was up 20 hours a day trying to care for his animals, but despite all of his efforts, 15% uh, of, the, of the flock population died. So outbreaks can be severe. They can also be unrecognized. Cattle and goats, it's usually subclinical. You don't notice it. But they can also have lesions in the mouth, swelling, sore mouth. They don't want to eat maybe a bit of fever. There can be excessive salivation. They can have lameness. Sheep can have lameness as well. And there can be reproductive failure. This is, uh, these items are especially bad in Europe in the last decade. There's been a new strain of blue tongue where all of these have been very commonly found in cattle, not just in sheep. A big thing for cattle raisers in the United States is ranchers who try to export seed stock. If their animals are antibody positive, you cannot export semen, frozen embryos. It's a big impact economically, even if you don't, uh, don't recognize disease. So in the US, our serotypes uh, typically don't cause recognized disease. Uh, but blue tongue is a spreading disease. It's spreading from northern Africa all the way up to the Scandinavian countries of Europe in the last 14 years. And there's a new strain of blue tongue in Europe. It's called BTV8 that's causing severe disease uh, in cattle uh, and also large uh, reproductive losses. Mm -hmm. So before 2001, rarely was blue tongue seen other than the southern Mediterranean uh, touching countries of Europe. Um, in uh, 2005 and 6, it, uh, blue tongue 8 appeared, and within two years, it was in the Scandinavian countries and Britain. So blue tongue is a expanding disease. Many people feel that, that climate warming is allowing the vector to be able to go into new uh, ecosystems where previously it was too cold. Similar things have happened in the United States as well. Last year was the first time blue tongue was found in, uh, in, um, in uh, New Jersey. So in the United States, similar things could happen. And part of what I want to do is document the current, state, uh, uh, the current extent of the virus in the state of Wyoming, uh, and also the seasonal transmission dynamics. So disease outbreaks, again, it's recognized in the late summer, but maybe transmission is happening sooner than that. Severity, severity of disease varies by years. There's definitely outbreak years. Those years are usually years that are especially hot. Again, it's vector transmitted, so uh, climate factors can be huge in, uh, in trying to predict these outbreaks. Surviving animals uh, develop antibodies, which, um, which, which prevent serotype-specific disease, and those antibodies last for the life of the animal. So if I go out and I test a five-year-old cow and she's antibody positive, she's been infected. I just can't tell you whether she was infected in year one to five. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this, is, um, this is distribution of blue tongue uh, um, um, uh, that we found in my lab over the course of several studies. And what we found is that in pronghorn, although white-tailed deer and mule, mule deer really mimics this as well, we see the highest incidence in the eastern counties and a little bit up in the Bighorn Basin. Uh, we just recently did a study with, with cattle serum, and we found that in the eastern counties, 82% seropositive. We just, uh, with part of this study, we tested every cow and calf on this station, and I was hoping to get some antibody negative animals to put in my study. Way, way, way optimistic. No antibody negative animals on this station. And sheep, similar. 88% uh, that was in Goshen County. 
Uh, Bob, Baum, Bob Baumgartner volunteered his sheep for part of this study. And his sheep, like the cows uh, here at the station, were 100% antibody positive. Most of those were relatively old, uh, old ladies, but uh, anyway, antibody positive. So, how many of you have animals in Goshen County, cows or sheep? Do we have any animal raisers? Have any of you recognized blue tongue in your animal, or something that looks like it might have been blue tongue? Okay, a couple. In areas where there's a high prevalence of blue tongue or EHDB, <clears throat> disease is often not even recognized, even though all of your animals are antibody positive. What's going on here? Well, we don't really know, but these are some common, uh, common, um, 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 ideas for why that, why that is, and it's probably a combination of multiple of these. First of all, once, once you have a population antibody positive, they're mostly resistant, the young animals get antibodies from mother's milk, maternal antibodies. Those antibodies wane over 18 to 20 weeks, so cows and calves born in the spring are going to be protected from disease for the first four to five months of, of, of their life. And that may be why you really, in these areas where you have a lot of antibody positive animals, you don't recognize disease. Okay, so unanswered questions. We don't know what the annual infection rate. I know that 100% of the cows on this station are antibody positive, but how many get infected every year? Is it 30%? Is it 50? When does transmission start during the summer? Does the, is there perhaps transmission before you, before you see, um, see animals getting sick? And what is the effect of climate on when transmission begins in the season? And what is the effect of these cows and lambs that are born protected compared to antibody negative uh, calves and lambs? So our study design, we're going to use cattle as a sentinel species and follow them over three seasons. We're going to look at groups of calves that are maternal antibody positive and negative and compare the time of onset of infection and the amount of virus in their system. We're also trapping Culicoides bugs with these little bug traps and we're going to test for the virus there as well. So further goals that I think our research will also address is uh, define the current transmission season so if our climate is warming we can, uh, we can, we can see if there's a change and also, um, also identify the current types of virus circulating. Uh, prior to 2010 there were five serotypes in the US. From 2010 on there is 10 new serotypes in the United States. So we need to document what's here at this point in time. So this is just an indication, again, we had uh, four or five before 2010. Since that time, 10 serotypes that were previously um, south of our border have now been identified in the United States.